Good evening. Uh, welcome to our second class and part of this three-part series on the Israeli-Arab conflict. My name is Rabbi Elliot Mathias. Uh, for those of you that joined us last night, I hope you enjoyed. We talked a little bit about the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, the history, the, 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 the claim of occupation that the Jews stole the land from the Arabs and how to deal with that, what that, what that looks like historically. Tonight, we're going to take a little bit of a different turn. And, you know, I mentioned last night, those that weren't here last night, I introduced myself again. My, again, my name is Elliot Mathias. For the last uh, 19 years, actually, I, I was the founder and CEO of an organization called the Hasbara Fellowships, where we educate and train college students to do advocacy on their campuses, pro-Israel advocacy, standing up for Israel against BDS and other anti-Israel propaganda, but also promoting Israel, being proactive, connecting with with other students and showing them why they, they should support Israel. And a lot of what we do is how to do advocacy, the facts, the figures. But one thing that I always try to get across is understanding why we do this. Why do we want to advocate for Israel? Why do we feel so connected to that place? You know, sometimes the why, if we don't have the motivation of the why, it's very hard to do the what and the how, right? And so what I want to talk a little bit about tonight is the why. why. Why are we so connected to Israel? Why is that place so, so, so important to us? And, you know, I, I, when I ask students this, you know, what do you love about Israel, right? So people say, ah, you know, the beaches and the soldiers and the falafel and the hiking, you know, all these amazing things that anyone's been to Israel, all those things are amazing. But I always think when I hear that, you know, it's like, Imagine you meet someone who says, you know, I'm, I'm an amazing, I, I, I am a huge, loyal Yankees fan. I love the Yankees, right? Say, so really? You love the Yankees? Tell me, what do you love about that? Oh, I love, you know, the smell when you walk into the stadium. I love the, the lights, you know, of, 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 at night when, it, when it's lit up, right? I love the uniforms, those pinstripes of the student, of the, of the players, right? I love the hot dogs and the Cracker Jack. I love the seventh inning stretch, right? And you say to the person, wow, that's amazing. You're a huge Yankees fan, but what do you think about the team, right? So, what team? What are you talking about, right? Sometimes I feel, because there's so many awesome parts of Israel, we see, I don't want to say the surface, but we see a lot of the things going on, and we don't always get to the essence of really what is our connection to that place. Why is it so important to us? And really, this is a crucial question, because as whether it's on college campuses, whether it's in the media, whether it's in other arenas, Israel is challenged. Its actions are challenged. Its right to exist is challenged. It's so crucial that we understand the why, we understand what our connection is to that place and, it's so, and why it's so precious. And by the way, this is addressed at the very, very beginning of the Torah, the very beginning of the Bible. We know that the Torah starts with, in the beginning, God created, right? Bereshis bara Elohim, God created the heavens and the earth. And the famous medieval commentator Rashi, who is from France, and he writes, Rashi wrote a commentary on the entire written Torah, on the entire oral Torah, the Talmud. And Rashi says something amazing. He asked the question, why did the Torah start with talking about the creation of the world? The Torah is a book of laws. It's a book of teaching us how we're supposed to act, what we're supposed to do in order to become holy people. Start with the commandments. Start with the mitzvot, right? And just tell us what we're supposed to do. And Rashi says something amazing. Famously, he says, the reason why the Torah starts with the idea of God created the heavens and the earth is to teach us. He says amazingly, and he was, he was alive in the 10 hundreds, a thousand years ago. He says, one day, the nations of the world are going to come to the Jewish people and they're going to say, Listimatem, you are thieves. You stole the land of Israel. This is what Rashi says a thousand years ago. And he says, what's going to be our answer? Our answer is going to be, gracious bara Elohim. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the world. God created the earth. God created the land of Israel. And he decided to give it to the Jewish people. That's our answer. Now, when I give that answer over to uh, some students on campus, they look at me and say, Rabbi, that, that's not going to fly too well. You know, on my college campuses, God gave us the land. And the truth is, I think Rashi, who is actually, by the way, quoting a Medrash, which has even preceded him, 
he understood that that answer maybe wasn't going to be heard by many of the nations of the world, even though today many nations, the Christian world, right, who accepts the Bible, they, they do in some ways accept that answer, but for many peoples they don't. And I think Rashi understood that. And what he was saying was, it's not that you have to go, uh, um, you have to go tell the nations of the world that we, that God gave us the land. It's not that you have to convince them. You have to convince yourselves. You first and foremost have to believe that the land of Israel, that the Jewish people are connected to the land of Israel, that it's something that spiritually, that it's in our DNA and it's something that we've been connected to for millennia and it's something that we'll always be collected, connected to. And if we really believe that, if we really feel that connection, then the why of why we care about Israel starts to, starts to materialize. You know, a few years ago, it's a number of years ago now, um, it was, I can't believe it's been over 20 years ago, I, I, had, I had gone to Israel, I'd spent a little time there, and I'd come back home, and uh, home being my, my, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, and I was visiting some friends, and I, I remember this like it was literally yesterday, I was sitting in the car with a couple friends, and they knew I had just spent time in Israel, and we were talking about it a little bit, and one of my friends says, you know, I just don't get it. There's so much conflict over there. There's so much violence, people fighting. They're just fighting about a bunch of rocks. So he said, they're just fighting about a bunch of rocks, right? Can't they just get over it? It's just a bunch of rocks. And it hit me like literally right between the eyes. Like, yeah, if you just think it's a bunch of rocks, yeah, what are we fighting about, right? But if we realize that the land of Israel is something that we've dreamed about for millennia, that we've been connected to generation after generation, that it means something. It's not a bunch of rocks, but it's what those rocks represent. You know, I, I, I read, a, um, I read a, a narrative not so long ago. It was a father and a son who actually had made Aliyah. They were from America. They moved to the land of Israel. They were sitting in Jerusalem in their car, actually right outside the old city in Jerusalem, and they were stuck in traffic right outside the old city. And traffic can be bad in Israel. They were just stuck in traffic, going nowhere. And the father said to his son, he said, you know, in a certain sense, here we are sitting in a traffic jam, just like any other city in the world. He said, but sometimes it occurs to me that the most boring details of our daily life were the, actually the greatest dreams of our ancestors. The most boring details of our life, being here, living in the land of Israel, were the greatest dreams of our ancestors. If our ancestors, and we're going to talk about this more, who prayed, who yearned, who dreamed to just see the land of Israel, let alone to be able to get on a plane and a few hours later they're there, to be able to live there, it was beyond their wildest dreams. And yet the day-to-day -day runnings, the day-to-day -day living in that land today is literally the dreams that have existed for thousands of years. And when you think about it, this is such a powerful, powerful dream. It's such a powerful motivator. You know, I think about sometimes what, what over the centuries and even today, what motivates people, what motivates Jews across the globe to leave their homes, leave their families, leave their, their life that they know to move to a place thousands of miles away where they probably don't speak the language, they don't know how to navigate the culture, right? They don't necessarily have a job, and this has happened for centuries and centuries. Going back to the 1700s, when there were Hasidic Rebbe's, very religious Hasidic Rebbe's in places in Eastern Europe, who literally picked up and brought their entire communities and got on boats that were, by the way, rickety boats. There's stories of boats that sank and, and Hasidim died on the way to just come to the land of Israel and to be in that holy place. What motivates a an Ethiopian young man, right? I heard this story recently. There was an Ethiopian young man. His name was Shimon. And in 1983, one day, he literally just started walking to Jerusalem. Him and thousands of others of Ethiopian Jews decided they were going to walk to Jerusalem. And they walked for weeks through the jungle and the desert. Literally, there were old people that died of exhaustion. There were babies that died from hunger. And they continued walking until they got to the country of Sudan, which unfortunately there was a, 
There were Muslim authorities there who persecuted them and out of fear they had to hide their Jewish identity and hide their customs and they were there for months and months at a time just waiting literally for the knock on the tent from the Jew that they had heard about who was coming on eagle's wings, airplanes which they had never heard of or seen before to take them to the land of Israel. And I think about even what motivates today uh, a 25-year-old American Jew who has a university education, a university degree, who probably has a great job lined up, has financial and social success laying out in front of them, and yet they decide to leave the United States of America and to move to Israel. Again, they can barely speak the language. They don't have a job. What motivates these people over the centuries to do this? And to me, this is not about a bunch of rocks. This is about an idea that Israel, the land of Israel represents an idea that for millennia we have been connected to, we have yearned for, we have dreamed for. You know, tomorrow, it's actually tonight it starts, and tonight and tomorrow starts what's called the three weeks. It's actually one of the saddest, maybe the saddest part of the Jewish calendar. It culminates in three weeks from tonight in the holiday or the, the, the day of commemoration called Tisha B'Av the day that we commemorate the destruction of the two temples in Jerusalem. And this three weeks is a period that we actually, the whole time we, we are commemorating the destruction of the temples. We slowly ramp up our mourning, right? Until the final day in Tisha B'av where we fast, we don't wear certain clothes and we, we really have a full day of mourning. And they tell a story, I'm not sure if it's a true story, but the, the, the idea behind the story is probably more powerful if it's whether, than whether the truth or not. They tell the story that Napoleon was one day walking in the streets of, of Paris, and it happened to be Tisha B'Av, this day of mourning of the Jewish people. And as he was walking through the streets, he passed by a Jewish synagogue, and he heard cries, cries, wailing, tears coming from people inside the synagogue. And he looked to his advisors and he said, what's going on? You know, why, why, is, why are people crying inside the synagogue? And one of his advisors said to him, you know, the Jews, their, their temple was destroyed. He said, their temple was destroyed? How come nobody told me their temple was destroyed? I said, no, no, no. It happened 1,700 years ago, right? And supposedly the story goes that Napoleon said, if there's a people today that are still crying, 1,700 years today, we say 2,000 years after their temple was destroyed, then they will surely merit to see it rebuilt. How does a person cry over something that happened 2000 years ago? In a few weeks, if you go into synagogues in Israel and America and certain places on Tisha B'Av, you will see people sitting on the ground in battered clothing, literally with tears in their eyes. How can we cry over something that happened 2000 years ago? And I think the, the answer and the flip side of the tears is because we have so actively nurtured our hope, our faith. We have, we have an amazing certainty that one day this, this sentence that we are in right now called exile will end and that God will retrieve us from the four corners of the globe and he'll bring us back to the land of Israel. We, we believe that so strongly. We're sure of it so strongly. We dream of it so strongly that when we have to think about the fact that it hasn't happened yet, it brings us to tears. And that's really what this time period is about. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, we can get used to a situation we're in. Sometimes it's a good thing, right? Human beings, we can adapt very quickly to a difficult situation. And sometimes that's good, right? Sometimes, you know, God forbid someone's blind, right? They, their other senses become stronger. They can almost get to the point, right, where they can maybe for a short period of time even forget they're blind, right? Because they've just become so used to it. And in some ways, unfortunately, that can happen to the Jewish people as well. We can become so used to the fact that we have amazing communities outside of Israel. We have success, financial success, societal success. We have beautiful synagogues. We have beautiful Jewish schools. We have the freedom to celebrate our holidays, to express ourselves as Jews, which are, by the way, all beautiful things. But we can also forget that this is not really how it's supposed to be, that we are in the state of exile 
And so at this time of year, we remind ourselves of that, that we have to remind ourselves about the yearning and the dreaming to go back to the land of Israel. You know, this connection to the land of Israel is so central to who we are. It's central, obviously, to the, the Torah, the Bible itself, our study of the Torah for centuries and centuries while we've been outside of the land of Israel has always connected us back to the land of Israel. One of the biggest, one of the areas of, of Torah study that's in the Torah that we study even till today are laws that specifically only pertain to the land of Israel. There's laws, for example, that have to do with the physical land, the land of Shemitah, excuse me, the law of, of Shemitah, of the sabbatical year, that every seventh year that we are commanded to let, to let the land of Israel, the, the agriculture lay fallow, that we don't work the land, right? Even in the centuries that we were not in the land of Israel, we studied these laws in and out, right? The laws of tithing, again, which is only applies to the land of Israel, we stayed connected to it. There's certain ideas, mitzvot, commandments in the land of Israel, that there's certain foods that we have to bring and eat only in Jerusalem. And again, you can go into study halls hundreds of years ago before Jews were in any way being able to go back to the land of Israel in Poland and Eastern Europe, today in America, and there's, we study these laws. We, it's almost as if you know, we, we understand the rhythm of the planting and the harvesting as though we are farmers in the land of Israel, even though we might be sitting very far away because we're so connected. Another aspect of the Torah and, and, and the, the laws that we study in the Torah that are, are so, um, um, that are only unique to the land of Israel is the studying about the temple in Jerusalem. Like I said, we're about to enter this time of mourning for the temple and there are huge amounts of pages of the Talmud and other books that are written that people study day to day about how to run the temple, what's going to happen in the temple, even though it doesn't exist today. You know, in fact, 140 of the 613 mitzvot, there are 613 commandments in the Torah, 140 of them have to do solely to the running of the temple in Jerusalem. That's almost a quarter of the entire Torah quarter of the entire 613 mitzvot have to do only with running the temple. And by the way, I didn't mention it before, but there's another 65 mitzvot that have to do with the actual land, the tithing and the sabbatical year, the things I mentioned before, which means you have over 200 mitzvot. A third of the entire Torah is totally 100% tied to the land of Israel. And like, so about to say about talking about the temple itself, these 140 mitzvot, you know, they say, that there were um, open miracles in the temple. And when we start to get into the why, why do we feel so connected to this place? It was a place of miracles. It was a place where God's presence could be felt, right? Some of the, if we ever go through life asking ourselves, is God there? Is there a higher purpose? What is spirituality? I find it so difficult to connect to. Going to the temple, walking into the temple in Jerusalem, spirituality was revealed. There were open miracles that were happening on a daily basis. Just to name a few that, were, that, are, that are amazing, one miracle they say is that the rain never extinguished the fire that was on the altar that stood in the temple. The temple had an altar. There was a commandment to have a constant fire flame going on that altar. And they say one of the miracles is that the rain, it doesn't matter if there were thunderstorms, you know, whatever it was, it never extinguished that fire. And maybe the deeper idea, I heard this once, the deeper idea is that, you know, rain, water and fire are opposites. They don't work together, right? But when they come together for a common purpose, a common purpose of holiness, a common purpose of spirituality, they're able to coexist. In a certain way, they're able to nullify their own desires, their own purpose for something bigger that they can come together for. And that's what spirituality is. That's what holiness is. And that's what Israel represents. Another miracle that happened in the temple was that they would say, again, on this altar, there was smoke that would come up from the fire. And they say that the smoke would go straight directly up. No matter how strong the winds were, the breeze, it would never disperse the, the smoke that would go up. It would go directly up from the fire. And again, this is a tremendous lesson 
that we would see spirituality right in front of us. So many of us, we, we try to connect spiritually. We try to, uh, 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 you know, connect to something bigger than us, but you know what? We're throwing curveballs. Sometimes there's a strong wind that pushes us off our purpose of what we're trying to accomplish. And so again, the temple was showing us this miracle, but teaching us this lesson of spirituality that we had to be so laser focused and not be, so to speak, pushed off by a wind from what we know our real purpose is. One other miracle they say that happened in the temple was that masses, masses amount of people could come and fit into a very small place that, that really, according to all the laws of nature, shouldn't be able to hold it. Every year on, on the three major festivals, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, there was a mitzvah for the Jewish people to pilgrimage up to the land of Israel, excuse me, up to Jerusalem and to come to the temple. And they say, the Talmud talks about the idea that, that they would squeeze into the temple. So many people would squeeze in, literally they couldn't fit. And, the, and it's described in the, in the Talmud that literally they say there were so many people squeezed together that their feet would be lifted off up above the floor because there was just not room for people to stand. But the miracle was that when it came time in the prayer service for everyone to prostrate, prostrate themselves, to bend down on the ground, all of a sudden there was plenty of room for everyone. Amazing, it was a miracle, right? And again, when you talk about spirituality that was revealed in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the temple, what does this represent? It represents this idea, you know, in the physical world, there's limited resources. If I have this car, you can't have it, right? If I have this house, you can't have it. But in the realm of spirituality, there's room for everyone. There's space for everyone, right? There's no competition when it comes to spirituality. And so when they got to the temple, as crammed in as they were, when they went to prostrate, to bow themselves down to God, there was enough room for everyone. So first of all, we see this, when we talk about this idea of, of yearning, of dreaming for Israel, being connected to Israel, why we're connected, we see there's it come in our Torah study, whether it's the studying and about the, the, the mitzvot that have to do with the land, the mitzvot that have to do with the temple, that through the centuries, even though these, we couldn't do these things, we stay connected to them. We also stay connected to Israel through our prayers, through our longing for the land, right? Every day, three times a day, when if we come to synagogue and pray, Every time we eat a meal, and if we say a blessing after the meal, we invoke our dream to return to our homeland. It's, it's codified into our daily routine so that we're constantly talking about it, remembering it, thinking about it. You know, it's interesting. There's a prayer in our daily prayers where we pray for rain. During the winter, we pray for rain. And in the summer, we pray for dew. Now, what's interesting is that no matter what the weather is outside my door, I live in New Jersey now, no matter you know, how much it's raining here in New Jersey, no matter how sunny it is, right? That's not what I'm praying for. My prayers, no matter wherever I am in the world, are based on the schedule of seasons and the weather of the land of Israel. That's really what I'm praying for. I go by the schedule of the rain season and the summer season, right? And I pray for rain and dew in that place because that's where my prayers are directed. And we know so many, not only our prayers, but so many other parts of our, of our Jewish customs and our Jewish actions that we do. I mentioned this last night, but just to mention it again, when two Jews get married under the canopy, the highlight of the wedding, right? When everyone says mazel tov, right? Actually, right before that, before we get to that point, we say under the canopy, if I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Right? This idea, again, at this pinnacle of happiness, of joy, of two people coming together in love and commitment, we remember Jerusalem. And we say, we commit that if I forget Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. And then we break the glass and everyone says mazel tov again. Why? To remember the destruction of the temples, to remember that we have to stay connected to that dream and that vision. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba Yushalayim, we say on Passover, at the Passover Seder, when we're reenacting our freedom, we realize that the only true freedom that we can have is by being in Israel. You know, even I've come to learn recently, there's a, a Jewish Ethiopian holiday called Sigd. I don't know if you ever heard of Sigd. It's an interesting holiday. It's an Ethiopian Jews uh, um, ha have this holiday. It's, a, it's, it's exactly 50 days after Yom Kippur. 
And what they would do, even when they were in Ethiopia, they would come from remote provinces, but they do it also today, the ones that are in Israel. They trek up a mountain, dressed in white, fasting. And what they used to do in Ethiopia, they would turn towards Zion and they would pray for their return, right? And today in Israel, they pray towards Jerusalem and they pray for its rebuilding. So this idea of constantly being connected in our daily routines, in our prayers, in our Torah study, of thinking about the miracles, the, the holiness, the spirituality that Israel represented, this is what the dream is. This is what the vision is. This is what the why of why we're so connected to that place. You know, in, in more modern Jewish history, a story that I always like, like to talk about is that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as we know, modern Zionism was created. Now, the idea of modern Zionism was that pogroms, anti-Semitism was intensifying across Europe, that we needed a solution for the problem of Jewish homelessness, that the Jews were, were unprotected. We needed to go to a place that was our own. And there was little political support across Europe for a Jewish homeland. The Ottomans who controlled the land of Israel itself did not want the Jews to come back. They were not uh, um, accepting of any type of autonomy or independence for the Jews in the land of Israel. And in 1903, Theodore Herzl, who was the leader of the modern Zionist movement, was approached by the British. And he was approached by the British with an idea that the Jews would be given territory for independence in Eastern Africa. It was called the, the, the Uganda plan. That basically the British thought, listen, if we give the Jews an independent territory in Eastern Africa, then we'll have a very nice colony that'll be loyal to us and the Jews will be happy. And Herzl was incredibly torn by this. He believed that he, his vision of Zionism, his vision of the Jews coming back was to the land of Israel. But he was also incredibly, he felt pragmatic. And he felt that who knows, we, we see already the increased hatred and terrorism and violence that's happening to the Jews. And who knows, this was 1903, who knows the horrific uh, uh, horrors that might lie ahead. And so Herzl walked into the Zionist Congress in 1903, and he put up a map of Eastern Africa behind him at the podium. And he addressed the delegates. And he said, I, I say this with a torn heart, but I'm urging you and I'm urging us to consider the danger that the Jewish people face and to accept this offer of the British to create a Jewish colony in Uganda. Wow, I wouldn't have wanted to be him up on that podium because he, <laughs> what he received was, uh, was, was a very difficult response. The, 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 the accounts that I've read was there was a, almost immediately there was a young Russian Jewish woman who marched straight up onto the podium and ripped down the map of Africa that was behind Herzl. It was mainly a secular socialist group of delegates led by Chaim Weitzman, who had become the first president of the state of Israel. But that delegation of, of socialist secular Jews, they walked out when Herzl was done speaking. And they say, this is unbelievable. And the timing now that we're talking about this three weeks and Tisha B'Av, the time of the destruction of the temples where we cry, they say they walked out of Herzl's speech and they went into an adjacent room and they sat on the floor in mourning, as Jews do on Tisha B'Av, because they said, this is not the dream. We did not come this far, this many centuries and millennia of exile. And maybe, yes, we don't, we're not observant into this in, in the traditional way, but it's in our hearts, it's in our souls. The Jewish people are meant to go back to the land of Israel, and that this is what, the, and, the, and this is what it's about. You know, there's an interesting debate in Jewish law about whether technically is there a mitzvah, is there a commandment to live in the land of Israel? And there's a famous debate between two of the most famous medieval rabbis. One was Nachmanides and one was Maimonides. Nachmanides, when he codified Jewish law, the 613 mitzvot, he says, yes, absolutely. There's no question 
The Torah says it clearly. It tells Abraham, go to the land of Israel, and tells Isaac and Jacob, and it tells the Jewish people, you're going to live in the land of Israel. He says, absolutely, one of the 613 mitzvot is to live in the land of Israel. Surprisingly, Maimonides, when he codifies Jewish law, and he codifies the 613 mitzvot, he does not include living in the land of Israel as one of those laws. And all the commentators are perplexed. How could it be that Maimonides does not include it in the 613? And they're really perplexed because he spends ample time and ample space talking about how important it is to live in the land of Israel. Just a few things. He quotes a, a few things from the Talmud. He quotes the idea. The Talmud says that a person who walks the, the, the language is for amot, which is a, an ama, an amot is a, is a distance. It's about, let's say, seven or eight feet. Someone who walks that distance, seven or eight feet in the land of Israel, the Talmud says, and the Rambam quotes, it says, that person is assured to go to the world to come. That's how holy, just a walk, let alone live in the land of Israel, just a walk in the land of Israel, a person is assured to go to the world to come. Maimonides also quotes the Talmud that says a person who dwells in the diaspora is like a person, person who worships idols, right? Now that's, that might put some people on the edge of their seat. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. I'm sitting here in New Jersey. That's what the Talmud says, right? A person who dwells in the diaspora is like one who worships idols. Maybe a, a way to understand that is that the, the, the Talmud is saying that it's so, the environment we live in is so important and putting ourselves in the proper spiritual environment right, is so important. And if we don't, we get impacted by that environment. And so if we're not living in the land of Israel, which is supposed to be this place of holiness and spirituality, it's as if we're worshiping idols because we are getting impacted by false ideas and false morals that are all around us. But Maimonides quotes these things, which seem to say it's pretty important to live in the land of Israel. He actually codifies two other parts of Jewish law. He says, by the way, that a, a, a Jew is not allowed to leave the land of Israel once you're there, except for three reasons, to make a living, to get married, or to study Torah. Those are the three reasons why a person can leave. So again, he's saying it's so important. And finally, you know, he actually says, this is, I don't know if this is good marriage advice, but the Maimonides quote brings down as Jewish law that if a married couple if one of the spouses wants to make Aliyah, to move to the land of Israel, and the other one doesn't, that is grounds for divorce. That's what he says, right? It's not, again, he's not giving marriage advice. He's not saying that's what you should do. Hopefully both want to go. But that's how serious this is, right? That a person's connection to the land of Israel. So how can Maimonides not codify it as one of the 613 mitzvot? So there's different answers that are given. One of the answers is that that, that Maimonides was, um, well, really, I'd say the main answer, the main answer, which I think is the, is, 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 the, is the best answer, is that Maimonides is saying that living in the land of Israel is so fundamental to so much else in the Torah, if not everything else in the Torah, that it's beyond one individual mitzvah. Meaning it's not that he's arguing with Nachmanides and saying, no, I don't count it. He's saying it's a, it's a meta mitzvah. It's a super mitzvah. It's worth even more than a mitzvah. And that's why I'm not including it in the 613. You know, we started this tonight by me talking about the why. What is the why? And so we talked a lot tonight about how we're connected to the land of Israel, what we do to be connected to the land of Israel, how we dream and envision to go back to the land of Israel. But again, the ultimate question is why? Why is that place so important? And I think what it comes down to is understanding that the Jewish people have a mission in this world. The Jewish people have a mission to be a godly people, to be a people of spirituality, to be a people of holiness, a people of kindness, a people of service, a people to make the world a better place by bringing values and morals into the world. That is the mission of the Jewish people, to bring this holiness to the entire world. Now, we can do that as individuals. An individual can try to be holy, can try to bring spirituality into this world. We can do it as a community. We can get together with other people, other Jews, other people are like-minded and try to have a bigger impact. But ultimately, if we want to really fulfill our mission and potential in this world, we can't just do this mission as individuals. 
And we can't do this mission just as a community. We have to do it as a nation. We have to do it as the nation of the Jewish people who has a shared common mission to bring godliness and holiness into the world. And so Judaism is really meant to be lived communally. It's really ultimately meant to live, be lived nationally, that there's a shared national ethics and behaviors to bring godliness into the world. And so Israel, the land of Israel is the gift that God has given us where the Jewish people can come together as a nation and fulfill their collective mission of bringing spirituality and values and morals into the world. The land itself has superpowers to help us accomplish that. Whether it's like the temple, which I mentioned before, where there's open miracles. Whether it's just, you know, you go to the, the hills of Sfad or the, the streets of Jerusalem and you just feel more connected. You feel more connected to spirituality, to holiness. The land of Israel is that place where we can come together as a nation to fulfill our purpose. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more we could talk about the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, but I hope tonight you just got a little bit of taste. You know, this, as I said, as we go into this three weeks, as we go up to Tisha B'av and we, we think about and we mourn the destruction of the temples, the question is why? What are we missing? What are we missing? Do we even realize we are missing something? I hope after tonight we can a little bit realize we are missing the ability to connect and to fulfill our purpose in the ultimate way. We can do it as individuals. We can do it in the diaspora a little bit. We can do the best we can, but ultimately to fulfill our mission as a people. Soon in our days, we, sh we should all hopefully be inspired to go back to the land of Israel as a people, as a nation, and to fulfill our true purpose. Thank you very much. Tomorrow night will be the last class in this series, talking about more the modern day issues, the Trump plan, the annexation plan. So please join us for that. Have a great night.